Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services, and markets. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the former UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, has told us the economy is now stabilizing after the tumult of the Liz Truss Premiership. Well, hundreds of billions of pounds were wiped off UK markets during Truss's brief stay at Downing Street, which began just over a year ago. Now, in a wide-ranging interview to promote her new book on the abuse of power, May also defended her handling of Britain's EU exit, telling me her approach to Brexit was the right one. I'm on record as saying I think my deal was better than the deal that was finally concluded. But I couldn't get my deal through the House of Commons, so somebody else had to go have a go. Yeah, but, but you were also personally, you know, they, they said that you were maybe not as exciting as others. Boris Johnson proved to be very exciting, a little too exciting. Well, I think it, it, it's interesting. It's one of the things that I think I took from my childhood. I, my father was a clergyman, so I was brought up in a country vicarage. Uh, in uh, in uh, just out you know, in Oxfordshire in the UK and in that time I sort of learnt that I wasn't just myself I was representing in a sense my father people looked at my behaviour mm -hmm. and, and sort of saw my father through it and similarly the church and it's a little bit similar in politics that as an individual you're not just there as the individual you're there as a representative of your party of your government and in international affairs of, of your country and so I've always taken the view that one must be careful in the approach that, that I took um, uh, to uh, what I said and how I approached issues. And yes, some people said that wasn't very exciting. But, but so d does, does your style and the way you did business d at the end, was it vindicated? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a different way of doing business. Okay. I think it had worked to get some results that I thought were good. Um, others had a different style and came out with a slightly different result. Uh, what we will see in the future, of course, is as the country moves on, um, how the country deals with uh, the situation that it's on. And that's important for us now in, uh, in our economy and business is, is to move on. Do, do you think you were held to a different standard because you were a female leader? I don't think, I mean, I think there was some different expectations. Some of the um, male colleagues would, for example, have, have said, and sometimes actively said to me and openly said to me that uh, when I was negotiating with the European Union I should have been thumping the table, I should have been walking out of the room, I should have been slamming the door. Those very sort of aggressive ways of doing it. In, in fact, I had spent some years before I went into Parliament in a position where I was negotiating with the European Union, uh, uh, the European Commission, and uh, I'd learnt through that that it was painstaking, slow, deliberate and careful negotiation on the details that got you where you wanted to be. But has politics changed in the last five to six years? The way we communicate, the way diplomacy around the world, frankly, is done? I think politics across the world has been changing in recent years. I say, I say in the book, I think we live in a more absolutist world, a sense of you're either 100% with me or 100% against me. I think there are some in politics who um, find it difficult to accept the concept of compromise, whereas we know um, in politics, in business, in everyday life, sometimes you actually have to compromise. And I think there has been, um, in some senses, if you look at politics today, there's less respect than there has been in the past, perhaps a, a, a coarser debate. I don't think that's good, and I think sometimes that puts young people off, um, which is not good for the future of our democracy. Uh, what's your biggest regret? Well, I have to say, my biggest regret is not getting the deal I wanted to get through the House of Commons. Um, and I think every Prime Minister leaves office feeling that there were things that they wanted to do. So some of the things I started have now been completed. I introduced a new um, Domestic Abuse Act, for example, which is now on the statute book. I introduced, did some work for a new Mental Health Act, which has not yet reached the statute book. We still have, uh, that still has to be brought forward. So th there were always things that if you'd had a little more time, you hope you would have completed. It, did you feel at the time that the Brexiteers actually left it to the Remainers to, to, to get the job done because they didn't really have a blueprint of what they wanted? Well, ultimately, they, I think some of them found it difficult to think that a Remainer, because I'd voted Remain, could deliver Brexit for them. And so, therefore, obviously, after me, they went for Boris Johnson, who had led the Brexit campaign and was a, was a Brexiteer. And during the, the, the debates and towards the end of my time, we saw 
uh, sort of hardline Brexiteers looking for a very hard Brexit, hardline Remainers wanting a second referendum to stay in. And uh, that's why Parliament couldn't come together. Do, do you think we'll ever get a second referendum? No, I think the, deci the decision has been taken. And I have always taken the view that if you ask the people their view and they give you their view, you should act on that. I think it was the democratic will of the people that we left the European Union. But I think now what we must be doing is saying, actually, we've done Brexit. Let's stop thinking of life in terms of Brexit. Let's move on and look for the future. The ex m and boss, Stuart Rose, says Brexit will be reversed within 20 years. Do you think that's possible? Well, I think a, a lot of people, when they look at that, are thinking of, if you like, the current circumstances of the European Union. Over the next 20 years, the European Union is going to change. Um, its structures will change, its membership will change. So it will be a, it will be a different body. The UK will develop over that, that 20 years. If you look back, there's always been an issue, even since we first joined the common market, as it was then, there's always been a slight concern in the UK, an island nation, about this sense of being sort of attached to a group in, in Europe. And that came to its head for a variety of reasons in the referendum. I think part of that was part of the wider political uh, sense that we've had across the world of people feeling globalisation hadn't been working for them, some people have been left behind and people in the UK wanted their politicians to change. But, but looking forward five, ten years, could you see an arrangement where actually the, the two are closer together? Well, I think what we've already seen, for example, the UK negotiating to um, rejoin Horizon, Science, yeah. I think is a very good example yeah. of a recognition that sometimes there are things there that it's good to be part of that, um, yeah. uh, you know, in relation to the EU. And I think over time we will see those uh, you know, number of areas. Uh, there are some areas on the law enforcement side, which I mm -hmm. recognised as Home Secretary, where I hope yeah. we'll be able to, to um, get greater access to some databases and things like that. But I think there's a recognition now the need to sit down and say well what makes okay. sense right and what do you think makes sense and again depending on what happens at the next election do you think that will again be on the table if not another referendum certainly closer business ties I think over time governments will be looking to see what makes sense for economies on on both sides for the EU <coughs> but also for the for the UK economy and businesses in the in the UK as well do, do you ever regret making Boris Johnson your foreign minister no, I, I was very clear when I set my cabinet that I needed to have a cabinet that was both Remainers and Brexiteers. The result of the uh, referendum was clear, mm -hmm. but it was close. And what I want, always wanted to do was to deliver Brexit, but a Brexit that recognised the concerns of the 48% who had voted to remain. Boris had led the Brexit campaign. I think therefore it was right that he was in the cabinet in a prominent role. We've had quite an eventful let's call it that, 12 months in UK politics, in UK business and UK markets. Do you think things have stabilised after the mini-budget of last autumn? Yes, I think things have stabilised. I think uh, Rishi, I mean, it started Jeremy Hunt being brought in as Chancellor, I think, was the first step, but Rishi taking over, obviously, as uh, leader of the party and Prime Minister, with Jeremy in number 11, has stabilised uh, stabilised matters. I mean, it's been difficult for economies around the world with the pan impact of the pandemic, and you know, we're all still coming out of that. Um, but I think, and what I see, and what I hope markets and businesses see, is uh, a, U a UK government that recognises the importance of sound public finance. Former UK Prime Minister there, Theresa May, uh, her, with her takes really on the Brexit deal negotiations, Boris Johnson and the UK economy. Now, coming up, why Theresa May believes the capital riots were a wake-up call for the West and why China cannot be ignored. More from our interview with the former UK Prime Minister next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, we've heard from Theresa May on British politics, but she was also Prime Minister during the Trump presidency. Well, she told us the Capitol Hill riots was a wake-up call to the U.S. and other Western democracies that political stability should not be taken for granted. Well, we spoke to her about the U.K.'s position on China, and that's, of course, as the government faces renewed calls to label Beijing a threat after the arrest of a parliamentary researcher on suspicion of spying. 
Um, you can't ignore China, huge economic presence uh, across the world, although the Deputy Prime Minister identified it as the number one state-based threat to our economic security, but it's a huge presence economically for businesses, but also, of course, in terms of the, um, the way it has reached out across the world. Sometimes being able to take a position in countries because the West has not been there. So we should learn from that, I think. Um, but we have to balance. There are real human rights um, issues with China. You know, I'm involved in setting up a global commission on modern slavery. Um, if you look at the recent Global Slavery Index, it identified solar panels being created in China and labor exploitation behind those. So we have to look very carefully. And businesses can make a huge difference in looking at their supply chains. But at the moment, do you think we're too hard on China? And is there a danger that if you look at the template of what happened with Russia in the Cold War, we're repeating that with China today? Well, I think what was interesting in, if you think about Russia in the Cold War, is in a sense, both sides knew where the dividing lines were uh, and were able to, to, there was an existence that was able to go into the future with people understanding those dividing lines. Um, and I think maybe we haven't quite got to that point with China. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting if you look at somebody like uh, Kevin Rudd, former Australian Prime Minister, who's very knowledgeable on China. He sets out that as one of the potential ways forward. Um, President Trump had given you a hard time. What do you think a, a second presidency, if he wins the next election, min means for the world? Well, I'm not going to speculate on the result of, uh, of an American presidential election or indeed on the result of, of parties' candidates and who they choose for candidates. I mean, what I would say is that it was, um, I would say, a presidency like no other uh, when we saw President Trump in, in uh, his uh, position. Uh, and it was a more unpredictable, perhaps an uncertain presidency. I think what we see now, and in a sense the war in Ukraine has helped with this, is, is America again with its Western allies standing up for Western values. But do you see abuse of power in the US? What I worry about in the US is the polarization of politics, the, what I would say the very hard line polarization of politics. And uh, I, as many around the world uh, in democracies, were deeply concerned about the mob attack on the Capitol uh, and what that meant for democracy. And I think it, it in a sense, was a wake-up call because for, in recent decades, I think those of us in the West have taken the view that liberal democracies were in the ascendancy, that this was an accepted way forward, and we almost didn't need to worry. We became complacent. Actually, we have to fight. We have to work hard to protect democracies and to persuade younger generations in our own countries of the importance of democracy. But are these cycles in the politics and foreign affairs of the world, or is it social media? Well, I think um, you can argue that politics does have its cycles. Um, if you look at the economic situation, many would say, I've referred to the 1970s, no. many would say we're seeing that, that sort of cycle. But I think that my own view is social media does have an impact on these issues mm -hmm. in terms of the nature of political yeah. debate. Um, and I think it, it means that somebody whose views normally would perhaps be dismissed or not listened to can promulgate those views across social media and other people similarly thinking will respond it becomes a world view and the danger is that people only listen to people who have their say, the same views as them and don't inter enter into what we need in politics which is a respectful and serious debate because we're all facing some really tough issues. Um, in, in your book, you, you talk about concrete examples and, and you unpick the kind of abuse of power. Do you think it, it will get worse before it gets better? Well, I hope that having written the book, having, uh, if you like, shone a light on this issue of the abuse of power, that actually people will start to say, yes, there is something there. What can we do to have a different approach? I mean, the fundamental of the book is that, um, you know, I start off by saying, a, a, in an interview, I'd said that being prime minister was not a position of power, it was a position of service. I think all those who are in politics are there in a position of service and should never forget that. So why do young people not, not want to join politics? How difficult is it? 
Is it because you get dragged through the mud? I mean, politics was always a, a dirty business, but what you're also getting at is that it's maybe harder now than it was 20 years ago. I think that for a, a lot of young people, I think that the world is different to the world that perhaps I grew up in. I think there is an element of some people who don't go into politics, particularly, sadly, women who don't go into politics because of the bullying, the harassment, the threats on social media, for example, and feeling that that's not something they want to, they want to be part of or one of the recipients of. Um, I think also for young people, often these days, they're having to cope with really difficult some with really difficult times. I think we do see a younger generation who are now worried that they won't be better off than their parents. You know, we've seen through time, every generation has hoped that its children will be better off. But now, you just look in the UK how difficult it is for young people to own their own home, for example. Um, as I said earlier, the impact of higher interest rates of inflation has been something they haven't had to cope with before. And I think that sort of day-to-day -day managing yeah. and a feeling perhaps that the politicians haven't responded to those yeah. needs um, perhaps also has, is an element of putting them off politics. Former UK Prime Minister Theresa May there sitting down with us for that wide-ranging interview. Now more ahead on Theresa May's views and her legacy as Prime Minister will get the take of Bloomberg Opinion's Adrian Woolridge. That's coming up shortly and this is Bloomberg UK. look at the aggregate GDP numbers, it's going to be slowing. You can't escape that. The demographic drag is going to be enormous. But if you look at the individual income levels, it's going to be continuing to steadily rise because productivity is getting higher. China's getting smarter. They're, being, they're going to be able to make EVs. They're going to be able to make smartphones with more of their own internal components and so on. So to come back to your question, Francine, do they care about this? Yeah, they care about it. Like, bragging rights are important. They'd love to overtake the United States. They'd love to regain their historical position as the world's biggest economy. Um, but if individual incomes are still rising, if still pe people are still getting better off, if they're still willing to make that kind of Faustian pact with the Communist Party, that the Communist Party can stay in charge because they're still delivering rising prosperity, I think that's going to be OK from Beijing's perspective. Well, that was Bloomberg Economics' Tom Orlick on the impact of China's slowing population, whether it cares about overtaking the U.S. economy. And yes, we've moved it to the 21st century. You can watch now, not only listen to the full conversation of the In the City podcast that I host alongside David Merritt, but you can actually watch it. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your uh, podcasts. And be sure to subscribe. It dropped today, but you can also look at it on YouTube. Now, let's return to our interview with the former UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, here with me uh, for his take, one of the smartest minds when it comes to historical UK and, of course, putting it into what we could expect from the UK in the next 20 years is Adrian Woolridge from Bloomberg Opinion. Adrian, first of all, congratulations on all your columns. I really enjoy them because they always have a little bit of a different take, so I urge everyone to, to really go and, and listen to them. Theresa May was interesting because she has a book out, yep. and really it's, it's a good time to reflect on what she lived through and I guess the question is, will we ever see a politician like her again rise to the top? Um, I think yes and no. I mean, no in the sense that she's a very, very awkward person. Um, and she's really a sort of senior civil servant rather than a politician. She yeah. was sort of miscast as a politician. But yes, in the sense that she's a pragmatist who's trying to find um, practical solutions to practical problems. He's not a sort of person who relies purely on, on charisma like Boris Johnson. I think we're moving back in a more charismatic direction. So uh, Rishi Sunak is a, more, is a better retail politician than her, but he's essentially a technocrat, a pragmatist. So that mould of sensible people being in charge rather than, well, Boris Johnson, who I don't think anybody, even his friends, would characterise as sensible, I think is, we're seeing that, that twist in politics, that so, turn in politics. Adrian, what was your main takeaway from, from the interview? I, I kind of, you know, really cast my, my mind back to some of those backstabbing moments and horrific yeah. moments, but then she left and it was even more chaotic. Well, I, I think that the, 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 the cliche about Theresa May is that she was delivered a very bad hand and she played it badly. And I think that's, that's a cliche because it is correct. Um, it was an incredibly difficult time, partly because the country was divided right down the middle, slight majority, but only a slight majority for, for leave, um, and partly because we hadn't planned 
for, for what to do after Brexit. They were selling us the, the, the levers, which is one reason why they won. They, they were selling us a blank, blank cheque, and everybody filled that cheque in according to their desire. There was no, 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 no plans in the civil service, no plans, I think, in, in Boris Johnson's head um, as the, the leader of the Leave campaign as to what to do afterwards. So, so she had to uh, deliver on um, a set of, of promises. She tried to do it by balancing the two sides. The two sides weren't really in a mood to be balanced. Um, and also, as a salesman, she was very weak. She was very weak for, for two reasons. One, that she's just not very good with people. And so she couldn't build the sort of coalitions she, she needed to build in, in, in Parliament. Nobody feels as though they, they, they'd know her. And secondly, because she didn't make um, a case I mean, an intellectual, compelling case for why both sides needed to come together to produce a synthesis, um, you know, to produce a compromise position. Uh, she started off by saying Brexit means Brexit and I don't like uh, all these people of nowhere and all of that sort of thing, and then tried to move back to the centre. But never did she really say, look, the nation has to come together. Both, you know, you, we have to compromise. People can't have exactly what they want. Adrian, very yeah. quickly, were you, I was surprised actually that she didn't throw anyone under the bus. Uh, during the interview. In the interview. Um, Are you surprised? Th I am a bit surprised. I think what we have in this country at the moment is a market. It, we have too many ex prime ministers trying to sell books. Even Liz Truss uh, has a book deal in which she's trying to sell a book on how to save the world in the next 10 years, which given that she destroyed the British economy in 47 days, I don't know what you do to the whole world in 10 years. But nevertheless, I think if you're selling books and selling yourself as an ex-prime minister, you need to give the people something. And she didn't really do that. Yeah, scandal. Adrian, thank you so much, thank as you. always, for joining us at Bloomberg Opinions. Adrian Aldrich there. Now, up next, uh, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues. Shanali Bazak in New York. Our Danny Berger is here in London. And this is Bloomberg News.